I'm really excited to share this one with you guys. As today we're going to be going over how to optimize a daily fantasy sports lineup in Excel. Um, we're going to be using Solver for this, and there are some tutorials out there already, uh, specifically for using Solver for this uh, um, this task. But um, we're going to be going a lot more in depth, I, I think, into actually how to find value over the markets um, for D uh, DFS. Um, specifically for NBA today, we're going to be using that as an example, um, just because of the conflict of interest between other sports and my my main jobs. Um, and then also, I, I think this model will be widely applicable to other sports as well. So it shouldn't really matter um, which sport you are really into. Um, these concepts and ideas will be applicable to other sports as well. So um, let's get right into it today. Um, the first, uh, well, there's going to be a few data sh um, a sheets of data that we need to download and uh, five in total, but uh, this, this model will be really useful because you can update it with just these five sheets every day. So um, if you're actually in the daily fantasy sports, you're playing this daily, um, make sure to you know just, just download these five sheets um, if you create this model um, and it should just update every day. So um, a pretty easy process there. Um, but the first sheet you're gonna need is uh, going to DraftKings here anyways. I'm not sure um, if you guys are using any other books or whatnot what for daily fantasy. I'm not sure how they do their um, lineup selection process or if they offer a CSV export. Um, but because DraftKings does, that's what I'm going to be using today. So um, the ultimate question that I pose to you is, is we essentially need to pick the eight um, players out of this selection of players that are playing today that maximizes our projected points total for the day. And using our model, starting with a, a blank Excel sheet, essentially, um, I've, of, of course, I've already built out the structure, but starting out with a blank Excel sheet and a few downloads, um, you will be able to manipulate the data and uh, create a working model um, you know, with embedded formulas and all that, that will um, eventually get to a point where it can select the optimum lineup um, for the given day. So that's kind of the goal for the day. So like I said, starting off with this export CSV, I've already done it, um, but that's going to be the first one to go with here. And looking at the actual model itself, this will be a good test for those who have followed me for a while because it's going to explore a lot of the concepts that I've um, you know, gone over over the past few years. And it's a pretty complex model, probably the most complex that I've built um, and shown on YouTube anyways. So it should be pretty interesting here. So let's take a look at the original sheet and ignore columns J uh, and, um, and onwards. Um, just to look at I, um, A through I right now. That's exactly what the download is going to look like from DraftKings. And so immediately um, when we start to, to post questions to ourselves of, you know, what do we need to do to manip manipulate this data uh, to begin to work forwards to optimizing a lineup? Well, first off, we, we obviously need to isolate each given player and they've already done that for us. So we don't have to isolate name and ID. Uh, that's already been done. So that's nice. We have every individual player. Uh, then moving on from there, we're obviously going to need the team that they play for and the opponent, uh, but most importantly, the opponent, because uh, one of the main ways you can adjust and try to find value over the market um, is by calculating um, and, and adjusting for opponent. Um, and this is, of course, going to be resulting in our, you know, our end goal of projecting player stats and then ultimately using those projected stats to select an optimal lineup. And of course, we do have a salary as well. I'll be talking um, more about that later. But uh, yeah, so moving on from here, of course, players are very important. Um, getting the opponent isolated will be important, which I'll talk about that in a second too. Uh, and then of course, a salary as well. We very much need the salary here uh, because that's going to aid us in the process of, well, it's, it's a hindrance in the fact that you can't just select any player. Obviously, you have to limit yourself to the $50,000 salary or depending on whatever league you're in or group you're in, you know, that may be different. Um, but based on the constraints that we have today, um, it's $50,000 salary, and we have to select the eight best players. Um, there also is some other roster constraints, which I'll talk about later as well. So um, here we have salary, we have the game info, which we're going to need to extrapolate the opponent from this uh, string here. We have the uh, team abbreviation. And of course, we're going to have to deal with different team IDs, different player naming um, mechanisms based on the different data sources that we pull from. And uh, once again, a thing that I'll, I'll talk about later. Um, and then we also have average points as well. This is just going to be a reference point for us. Uh, not really a great way to, you know, go about predicting and optimizing a lineup just using straight off of average points. It's something you can do, um, but it's not really going to, in my opinion, be all that successful. Um, just down to the fact that, you know, uh, players can have, you know, wide variations in their, at their average DFS points. Um, per game based on the opponent they're playing, the venue, all the different circumstances that surround a game can affect the average points, of course. So, you know, obviously injuries as well, another huge thing. So 
Um, looking at the rest of the sheet here, we're going to have to start pulling in some other IDs and, and trying to match them as well uh, because we are pulling in data from basketball reference. So uh, let's take a look at the other data we're pulling in today. Of course, we have the DraftKings right here. Um, then moving on um, to the injury report from RotoWire, which is going to be important because um, you know, optimizing a lineup is, is one thing, but uh, if you don't have injury information or anything like that, it's going to select players that are that are questionable or injured or, or game time decision or, um, or whatever. So, um, you know, pulling in players like that and having those selected uh, just makes it a really uh, ultimately useless um, process um, because you're always going to get players that are selected that are injured unless you have the injury information embedded in your model. So. A very important concept here, and luckily with the uh, RotoWire, you can actually just export this as a CSV, and that's exactly what I've done, and I'll show that in a second. Um, other data sheets to pull up here: basketball reference. We're going to need player stats, obviously, just average player stats, and that's how we're going to you know start off with the projections, and then we make adjustments to these average stats from there, and that's how we you know get to that that final projected points total uh, that I've mentioned already. Moving on from that, we have. Um, advanced NBA player stats. So these are going to be the defensive ratings, or it's going to. This sheet includes the defensive ratings, and uh, I'll talk about a little bit more, uh, you know, about this going forward, obviously. But uh, just for right now, I, I think the, the the main way that I'm trying to derive edge over the market um, with this model is doing a matchup uh, matchup adjustment. So not only are we adjusting for the team that they're playing, that each given player is, you know, playing against, but we're also going to be adjusting against their projected defensive matchup. So. That uh, aspect of this model, I think, is what makes it unique, and uh, can be widely applicable across, you know, other sports as well. Uh, uh, sports that have one v one matchups, anyways. You know, maybe not so much soccer or, or hockey, uh, but uh, if, if you think about football, for example, with wide receiver versus cornerback, that is something you can very much do. Uh, but obviously, maybe taking a little bit uh, more intricate ratings and, and metrics to do that. So, anyways, anyways, let's progress, progress from here. Um, so you have your advanced player stats, which of course are pulling in stuff like defensive win shares, which we'll be using, um, defensive box plus minus, um, and then also win shares per 48, um, except I'll be doing defensive win shares per 48. Um, but once again, I will talk about this ratings more as we go on. And then probably uh, one of the more important sheets is this opponent per game stats. So you're going to want to go to um, the team stats page, or I guess the season summary on basketball uh, reference for 2021. And then rather than taking the, the team per game stats, we want to take the opponent per game stats because um, we want to actually essentially adjust for the opponent and we don't really care about the team that the given player plays for. We just care about the given player's stats and then adjusting those for the team that they're playing against essentially. So uh, yeah, we care much more about the opponent with this model than anything else. So those are the five sheets in total. You have the Kings, you have the report, and then you have the three basketball reference sheets. And with those five sheets, we are going to optimize this lineup for today. And we're going to arrive at that, that the final eight player list, um, which um, will, of course, based on this model, be the highest projected points total we can possibly get. So um, starting off with that stuff now, we have basketball reference in here um, as, a, as B ref average. That's the name of the sheet. Then we have basketball reference advanced stats. As you'll see, I have some calculated formulas over here, which we'll talk more about um, going forward. And then I have the basketball reference team um, opponent, or rather, actually opponent stats, sorry, which of course will also go into the process of adjusting um, for you know each player's projected uh, points. So this is going to act as the master sheet into my projection sheet, and I'm going to be talking about all this stuff going forward. Um, but I'm basically just pulling all of this information into a final sheet, which will then you know will arrive at a number. So let's start off here, and with you guys right now, if you're going along as I'm talking, um, you guys will just have these blank sheets. So first off, we need to start adjusting for um, player names. Um, so you're going to want to create probably an ID sheet um, with uh, columns of the different IDs. Um, so for team names, for example, we have the, the short ID, the simple ID, and we have the long ID for basketball reference. Um, then you're also going to have to probably add in a, uh, a short ID for... DraftKings, and uh, this is something that I've kind of just done manually here, but I've just shown this as an example. Um, it's probably something that's, that that would be wise to include. So then you can just you know use the index match matches, and I'm not going to go over all that stuff today because it's something I've already talked about in previous videos on multi uh, multiple occasions. Um, but you know it's just something that's very necessary to to clean data and to uh, to make it all seem you know streamlined anyways into a final model. Uh, then the player ID is the same idea here where we have DraftKings. Basketball reference. I'm only I'm only pulling in a few players here because I'm essentially just pulling in the players that have uh, unique names in comparison to the two data sources. 
Um, so you have guys like, like Nurkic, Saric, a lot of the foreign guys with the different asterisks over their letters. And then sometimes you have guys like, like Xavier Tillman, um, who is a senior uh, for basketball reference and who is just, uh, you know, just Xavier Tillman for, for DraftKings. So yeah, different little intricacies there. Uh, JJ Redick as well is another example, just a, a, a initial, to, you know, uh, first digits in his name. Anyways, so moving on from that, you're going to want to have those two though to index match. And that's kind of how I'm arriving to these, these final, you know, basketball reference name, just adjusting um, the DraftKings name. And if the name is unique um, to DraftKings compared to basketball reference, then I change it to the basketball reference name based on the ID, you know, sheet that I have that I just showed you guys. So I'm not going to go all into these formulas, but uh, it's essentially it's just testing okay, is is this given player appearing on that sheet which has the unique names? If it is, then I change it to the basketball reference, or I, I call in index match the basketball reference, and, and that's going to be the one that's returned. And if it's not, then it just returns the usual badge name because they align in both sheets. Extrapolate the opponent from this game info. And unfortunately, DraftKings doesn't list the opponent separately from the team abbreviation, so it's just another uh, you know, little problem that we have to solve here. And the way we're going to do this is we're basically going to take the first seven digits of this string because those first seven digits will represent both the opponent and team. You have uh, Brooklyn at Washington, um, and then you have you know Philadelphia, Indiana, just those first seven um, digits of the string we need to focus on. So what we can do then, and, and I'm not, once again, I'm not going to explain exactly like I don't want to talk too long about this stuff because this model this model is so complex that you know I could end up talking for for hours about this thing um, if I were to go into everything but what I'm basically doing here I'll kind of explain it is I use a left formula here or, um, and what, what it's essentially testing is we take the first seven digits the, so the seven digits on the left of the string and then we take the first three digits of that seven digit string and then we test um, basically if the team abbreviation in H2 is equal to that first three digits. So then we're basically testing, okay, is the team that the player is playing on right now in this selected row, um, is it the home team or away team? And if it's the uh, away team, then it of course will be the first three digits. If it's the home team, then we know that we need to take the last three digits of that seven digit string, and that's the opponent. And that's essentially that's what I'm doing here. Um, uh, the first, the first um, thing here is actually adjusting for the few teams that have two digits as their, as their, um, as their names: so Golden State, San Antonio, and, and New Orleans. And then I'm doing that test, like I just explained to you there, and that's how we arrive at that opponent opponent from this given original string. So yeah, using like the left formulas and the right formulas can be very useful when it comes to extrapolating a string from inside a a, a larger string in Excel. Um, then moving on, we have position. So all this is doing is um, we have the position column here and column A. Um, of course, the center is the one position that just has a single letter um, position name or position ID. So we basically just need to test, okay, is the if the position is center, if the first letter of the string, as you can see here in the left formula, um, if the first letter of A5 um, is equal to C, which would mean he's a center, it just returns C, but if it's not, then it just returns the first two digits because then we know it's a either point guard, shooting guard, small forward, or power forward, which all have two two letters as the position identifier. So that's that um, explanation there. And um, then when it comes to um, arriving at the baseball reference or sorry basketball reference team and opponent, and once again we're just going to be referencing. Um, well, actually, we're going to be changing those those few you know, names that uh, have only two digits rather than three, and so this is just all the tedious, you know, um, position uh, uh, team ID stuff, and it's not something that's you know all that interesting to get into, and and uh, something that I don't really want to talk about too much today, because it is a very important part to the model um, and to the you know, eventual outcome um, when it comes to cleaning out this data, uh, but it's not the ultimate topic of this video, so I'm going to move on. Uh, but essentially, you see what I'm trying to do here, um, arriving at a very a consistent ID, so we can just re continue to reference those consistent basketball reference IDs throughout this entire spreadsheet. Now, this is something that's different. Um, essentially, what we need to do now is that uh, since we're trying to identify the, each player that uh, is going to be guarding this the given player, so for example, James Harden here is actually listed as a point guard, and we're actually going to need to identify his matchup ID, which is essentially 
his position and team name because that's going to be the ID uh, that is then paired up with the opponent in the position and that's how we arrive at that matchup uh, between James Harden and whoever they are playing which is in this sense um, the uh, Washington Wizards so he's going to be paired up against Russell Westbrook, uh, Russell Westbrook because he is the point guard for Washington if that makes sense so obviously we're making a large assumption by assuming that position uh, versus position is always going to be you know guarding each other there's a lot of switching in the NBA um, but that's exactly why I will use weights later on in this thing so we actually only weight the position versus position matchup 20% into our final adjustments um, because I know, r roughly I'm just thinking okay there's one position on the, on the court uh, or one position represents 20% of all players on the court at a given time so I'm going to weight that 20% if that makes sense you know this is not something that's like you know it's not rooted in math or anything like that it's not rooted in theory it's just very simplistic um, you know logic that I'm using to kind of arrive at these these final formulas and, the, and these final adjustments so that's the matchup ID very important though uh, we'll be referencing that one later and then we have the injury as well so now we're going to pull up the injury sheet and this is what the rotowire injury sheet looks like when you download it just really useful i mean um, nice and nice clear and concise with uh, useful information and all we really need to know is the status of each player for the next game so you would need to download this every day but it provides a status for every game uh, or for the next game sorry for every player that is listed on an injury report essentially so very very useful we just pull that information in here we basically just use an index match um, and we essentially say if the player is listed on that sheet um, then we'll index the injury and if there's nothing indexed there on that sheet for the given player then it just returns a blank string or blank text and that's how we arrive at this final information here um, so moving on from that so that's where we're pulling in the injuries and remember I referenced that master sheet that projections sheet we're going to be pulling all that information into that sheet eventually um, just so we have everything in one place uh, here we have the best reference average so that's just copy and pasted so here's the next important part, and I'll sort of be going back and forth between this and the projections um, because we need to basically we need to assign a value to every single player defensively because we need to um, derive that that match of adjustment that I was talking about. So first off, we need to figure out okay how good is every given player defensively, and in which you know which facets are they going to limit uh, or hinder uh, another given player from scoring or you know getting rebounds or maybe creating less turnovers, stuff like that. So that's what we kind of need to figure out. Um, and so that's why I'm using these ratings and, and uh, essentially deriving these ratings from the advanced stats sheet. So first off, I just did a, a little um, uh, calculation for defensive win shares per 48. And all that is to arrive at a per 48 number is you're just gonna, going to divide the amount of minutes they played by 48. And then you're just dividing that defensive win shares number by that resulting number. So you're essentially saying, um, you know, we need, to, we need to calculate how many 48s they've played or how many full games they've played, and then you just derive um, the, the uh, or so you, der you derive that per 48 number by dividing um, defensive win shares um, divided by, you know, that, that 48 number. Anyway, so that's how you do that, but that's just a very simple um, calculation. Now, here's when it gets a little complex, and this is kind of just like my own personal rating. It's, a, it's not really, once again, not really rooted in math, just very simple logic i guess when it comes to basketball once again i don't actually play daily fantasy sports either so this is something that like if you're an experienced player you probably have an idea of your own rating system or you have an idea of you know how you kind of want to adjust or, or value these these players defensively uh, potentially you know if you're you know, if you're used to or have gotten into basketball analytics it's something that you've probably um, you know had in mind at some point so this is just kind of my interpretation and my decision of, of how I wanted to rate players defensively. So there's a defensive overall, there's, and then there's an adjusted number, and the adjusted number is the one that we're actually pulling in. Um, but essentially what I'm doing with this here is I'm taking the three defensive metrics that I wanted to identify, which is defensive win shares, uh, defensive bo uh, box plus minus, and then defensive win shares per 48. And then I'm weighting them into this final formula. I'm actually taking the percentile first and then weighting them into this final for formula, averaging the percentile, and then we get a number um, that's generally going to be between roughly 70 and um, about 140, I think, um, if I'm not mistaken, 160 actually. And this is the unadjusted number, but essentially what we're saying is, and I actually want to get to a point where 100 is average, but any number under 100 is going to adjust the, those projected stats of the player they're guarding downward because... Um, the number is essentially saying this player is better than average defensively 
and uh, the amount that they're below 100 is the value of below average that they're better than the, the given player. And of course, this is just my little makeshift formula here. Once again, this is probably a scenario where you want to come up with your own defensive overall, and it can be based on a numerous amount of ratings, but I just made this one very simple um, just because I wanted to keep things clear and concise. And ultimately, the, the goal of this video is not to you know be very successful um, at uh, Daily Fantasy Sports, is to showcase and give you the foundations for how you yourself can be successful and uh, you know derive value or find value against the market um, for daily fantasy sports. So here is this given formula that I've kind of been talking about. Um, like I said, taking the percentile of those three metrics that I identified, we're actually weighting it. So uh, defensive win shares per 48 is going to be the highest weight at 50%. Um, then uh, we have the uh, defensive box plus minus at, at 0.40 or, or sorry, 0.4 or uh, 40%. And then we have the final uh, defensive win share is just unadjusted number at 10%. And then we're basically going to try to get this down to 100. And the reason I have to do the 0.65 minus this sum is because uh, we want this number to be uh, lower. Um, so like the lower representing the better defenders rather than higher uh, the, the, uh, the higher numbers representing the better defenders. So we're actually adjusting that to try to get down where 100 is average, and then we're um, doing one plus that resulting formula. And that's, that's like I said, we want the, the lower numbers to represent um, the better defender rather than the higher numbers. And we just multiply, by, uh, multiply that whole thing by 100 to scale it to 100. And the adjustment that we're doing now is we're actually going to be using some average if statements. And an average if, basically you, you average uh, a given number um, based on criteria that you outline in the formula. So we have a range, and which is the position. And what we're saying is we want the average um, of the position of the given player because we're going to adjust it per position. Um, so actually, if you want to adjust the number results in lots of the centers being very high, uh, or sorry, being very low rated. But in this sense, uh, that's a good thing. Um, we have lots of centers you know, being listed there. And then when it comes to the unadjusted number, or sorry, the adjusted number, we're, we're adjusting more um, for the position that they're playing, and then uh, that results with uh, Matisse Thibault actually being the highest rated defender. And then ben Simmons, Anthony Davis. And it, the reason I did this is, is partly due to the fact that I think just using the eye test and seeing the players that are high on this list just makes a lot of sense. Um, looking at the data, I think it, it was scaled appropriately for position. And obviously, like I said, this is a very mixed formula, but at the end of the day, um, I'm not personally trying to win at uh, Daily Fantasy Sports over a long period of time. I just want to showcase, you know, and, and present some ideas about how you guys can. So that's the important defensive overall formula. We're going to be using that to adjust total points and also uh, three pointers made. And that's just another um, um, score part of the scoring system for uh, DraftKings is three pointers made. So that's how I'm, that's going to what I'm going to be using that for. And that's going to be, of course, the matchup adjustments, the actual player versus player adjustments, um, accounting for 20% of the final weight into the adjusted ratings. And then the other ones are very simple. So after I've made that adjustment, um, like I said, just uh, scaling it to where 100 is average, um, and uh, you know, just making it very presentable. We have the rebound overall, which will um, basically it looks at uh, once again using an average if statement, comparing the amount of rebounds any given player has compared to the average of their position. So anything um, below 100 will once again be better than average. Anything above 100 will be worse than average. And and at, when it comes to the final ratings, we're going to be multiplying uh, these numbers by the, the the final ratings. And so anything above 100 will. Um, adjust that number upwards and logically that makes sense right because if you're playing against a worse rebounder then your rebounds are likely to be higher than on an average game right so so anyone playing against Matisse Thibault obviously a very solid defender great guy as well I'm not really sure if you guys are familiar with Matisse Thibault but uh, very active um, player in the uh, the NBA community um, very uh, outgoing guy um, anyways aside from <laughs> aside from Matisse Thibault though uh, and his uh, personality his rebounding overall though uh, 160 so you know if you're matched up against him, um, your rebounds are probably going to be projected higher than average. Um, looking at some steals overall, same idea, um, where we're actually going to be looking um, at the turnover percentage of each given player. So obviously, if you turn the ball over more, um, it's going to just logically then um, the model is going to project the, that uh, that the, the matchups steals to be higher for the given player um, based on you know the the opposing player they're facing against. And then same idea with turnover, um, just reversed. Where if the given player, the given defensive player, 
uh, if his steal percentage is higher compared to average, um, then his uh, matchup that he's playing against will likely turn the ball over more. Uh, once again, very simple, just logical. Um, and it's one of those things where, you know, if you don't like this idea going into your model, you don't like the matchup thing, um, just feel free to overlook it and, and move on to something else and, and uh, actually maybe focus more on the team-based related um, defensive metrics because ultimately that's where 80% of the weight of this thing is going anyway. So uh, that's how we get to those final matchup ratings, which now appear here in the final projection sheet. They're just going to be um, pulled in from the advanced stats using a C, uh, you know a, the, uh, the classic index match that I've used so many times throughout my videos. And oftentimes we're slapping an if error on these things as well. So if the player doesn't appear on the list or there's some sort of error, it just returns a hundreds, which of course for us represents an average player. So just no additional adjustment is made. And so you know it's not like a perfect model. There are there are um, definitely some some problems and inconsistencies when it comes to players being um, called in. Sometimes if a player hasn't appeared this season yet, then they won't be like they're, they're let's say they're injured for a significant amount of time. Uh, Jaron Jackson Jr. actually the other night was a good example where he hadn't played too much a season or some or the model wasn't really pulling him in so it just returns a hundreds so yeah like not a perfect model but uh, I think it's a great foundation to start off of and I'll sh showcase exactly why um, moving forward here so yeah with this master sheet um, you'll recognize this point too this is going to represent um, the weight of the matchup ratings into the final rating so if I up this to 0.35 that would have a an effect on the final projections and thus an effect on the final optimized lineup I'm going to leave it at 0.2 for now just because I like that number, but uh, some of you guys will disagree, of course. Um, and uh, I, you know, very, very understandable because once again, when it comes to my research into the actual metrics, um, I not not very much was went into the thought process behind them, uh, other than just the simple logic, like I was talking about before. Um, so moving on here, we have the players being pulled in from DraftKings data, and we're using a few uh, uh, index matches here, uh, um, if NA, just to test again players that uh, aren't able to be called in and result in an error and ultimately then we call in the team we call in the opposition and this is all coming from DraftKings data uh, then we also call in their position now um, move, moving on to the injuries same idea just calling in the injuries from the DraftKings data sheet which of course are in column Q and you'll see that in the, that index map aligns with that as well calling or indexing a column Q in DraftKings data and then matching the player name to the player name in DraftKings data. Um, then moving on here, we have the average DFS points, which is once again just you know serves as a reference for us. And we're actually going to use it later as well to view the amount of adjustment that has occurred um, from the average DFS rating or uh, projections compared to the adjusted. And then we're actually going to show. I'm actually going to showcase you know how the model has selected players uh, generally that are um, you know being adjusted higher um, for the matchup related um, adjustments and how kind of that's essentially the way we're finding value here uh, but I'll, yeah i'll talk more about that later then we have salary being pulled in so here's the matchup id and uh we're actually not pulling this one in from DraftKings. we're actually going to concatenate uh the opposition and the position and remember i showed i showed you that matchup id earlier uh, but this represents the actual player bradley beals matchup which is going to be joe harris so we call that or we uh, concatenate the position and team we get that matchup id then we index match and actually pull in the player that bradley beal is projected to be matching up against based on his position of course and then uh, we're actually gonna yeah pull that in from DraftKings data so this is where the um the, the, the column p really matters because every player has already been assigned their matchup id and it's going to be pulled up called here and then pulled in and it results in every given player's matchup. So uh, yeah, it's it's pretty simple, um, I think, anyways, when it comes to um, assigning a player a matchup. But uh, obviously, there are, like I said, some problems with the model. Like for example, even though the injury information is in here right now, I don't actually have it embedded where if a player is out for the season or if a player is out for the game, he's he still may be called in as the matchup ID. So just a, a problem that can be fixed. But like I said, right now the the model is still in the very early stages. And it's not really something I'm, you know, I'm going to be putting too much time into outside of uh, just showcasing it for you guys and potentially, you know, um, letting you guys um, get your hands on it as well. So here are the matchup ratings I, I referenced earlier, all called in there, just using simple index matches. Of course, we're using the if errors as well to account for any um, uh, NAs or, or whatnot being called in. 
Then we have the opposition ratings, and this is a, this is pretty simple. I've already talked about stuff like this before in previous videos, uh, but very simple logic when it comes to coming up with these ratings. All we're doing is, as you can kind of see here, we're going to use an index match. So we're indexing Y, which will be that rating. Um, we get the defensive overall, which I can't actually remember what I used for that. Let's, let's take a look here, looking at Y. It is just points allowed per game, essentially. So that's what the defensive overall is going to be, which adjusts the um, player's projected points total. Um, then moving back to the projections here. So we're calling that in. And uh, so that's going to be that column Y and, and, and basketball reference team. Uh, we're going to be, uh, of course, indexing the team abbreviation. And then we're actually going to be dividing this final number by um, the average number for all teams. So we're just adjusting it for average and then scaling to 100, something that I've done plenty of times throughout my videos and something I've done plenty of times throughout the sheet already, um, like the scaling to 100, just, just to make it um, presentable, I think, because it's really, really uh, easy to figure out here that a 104 essentially means that the team that they're playing um, is defensively overall anyways, 4% worse than average or 4% higher than average which will result in Bradley Beal's points. It'll be adjusted upwards a little bit by that uh, that team total or that, that team rating and also up 8% um, or 8% uh, over average for Joe Harris. So ultimately uh, Bradley Beal's point total is going to be increased for this game um, due to those ratings. So same logic used throughout this whole thing though. Three point overall, I already mentioned I'm actually using that defense overall for the matchup rating as well um, to adjust for three pointers on the player versus player level on the team level of course we actually have you know three pointers made per game like it's hard to it's really hard to quantify three point pointers made against a singular player so it's not something that's included in the advanced stats so i just use that defensive overall for that one rebounds similar logic for three pointers just pulling it in from um, uh, basketball reference team as you can see here for the three pointers pull it from there uh, total rebounds pull it from there and I'll just adjusting them for average, scaling to 100 with um, lower numbers result, uh, resembling better defenses, higher numbers re resembling worse defenses. And same logic, like I said, used throughout that this entire thing here. So, yeah, it's a um, simple process when it comes to pulling in these ratings. I just wanted to, you know, have everything at, on a single sheet. And so same thing with assists, same things with steals. I'm not going to go into all that stuff um, because it is literally using the same process just to pull in the given column of data that we need. Now we have the projected player stats. Now this um, is where we start to adjust. And so we pull in for Bradley Beal, who is, by the way, having an outstanding season so far. It's uh, unfortunate to see him on such a poor team at this point uh, for the Wizards. But uh, yeah, currently putting, putting up 36.5. We're actually projected to put up 36.5 based on the adjustments being made. If we go to um, the average um, numbers here so this is just going to be average per game numbers and this is where these come in because we start to adjust them for every single player um, based on the of course the, the matchup and then also the opposition so i'm um, just pulling from here once again very simple um, index match and then we're just going to multiply the sum here which is this the reason I'm using a sum here is because I'm actually going to be weighting them based on this this 0.2 number, this 20%. So I'm actually going to be adding together the result of the defensive overall, which is that 108, multiplied by 0.2, and then also the uh, defensive overall for the opposition, uh, multiplied by 0.8, because that's just the way I've chosen to weight them. But if I were to change that number to a 0.35, as you can see here, if you watch... If you watch the uh, the points total, it'll probably change just a little bit um, based on this adjustment, but it will change. So, so 36.7 if we were to adjust for the matchup, and that makes sense logically because his, uh, Joe Harris's overall defense was at 108, while the overall opposition defense was 104. So if we weight the player rating higher, then that means his points total goes up because ultimately that defense rating that he's projected to play against will increase a little bit. So... Same logic used for the rest of this stuff, though. Once again, we're using an index match. We're nesting it inside a an if na to adjust for any errors that could potentially arise, and then we're just applying it for the for the whole thing to project their stats. So we pull in their stat, essentially their baseline stat, their average stat for the season. Uh, we then multiply it by that that multiplier, which is that number that results from the weighted formula here, um, from you know that calculated um, from the matchup rating and the opposition ratings. 
this thing. And then we get to a point where you projected all their stats that you need, and the stats that you need are going to be based off of the uh, scoring system for your, your daily fantasy sports league or group or whatever. So for uh, DraftKings here, it's I mean, are based on the website use as well. DraftKings, uh, the scoring is listed as such. I'm not going to go down the whole list, but you can just take a look there, pause the video if you really want to look at it. Um, but the stuff we need is all listed. So we need points, three points. We just need, we need all this um, to be for each um, player so that we can then you know derive their points total from it. So we have all this stuff. Uh, actually, double doubles and triple doubles count for bonus points too. So I've had to calculate whether a player is projected to get a double double or, or triple double. And this is where simulations can come into play because you can calculate a, a, a ceiling and a floor for each player if you wanted to based on simulations or based on um, you could use uh, uh, standard deviations as well. Um, but to do that, you would actually need all the players um, game logs essentially or stats for the season to calculate standard deviations for all these different um, ratings and then you could of course you know simulate this stuff as well um, but as of right now I don't I, I just decided to, to start off with this but if it's something you want to see as well simulating um, for to calculate DFS um, you know ceilings and floors for player um, points projected for the day stuff like that I can I can definitely look into and it's 100% doable with Excel but as of uh, as of the time being I'm just projecting a, a static points total based on the uh, of course the opposition and the matchup adjustments now um, another thing that I've done that's a bit quirky that uh, I don't know if it's once again just a just a quick thought you know I'm not really something I've looked into that much um, but I've actually decided to have my own little way of multiplying and adjusting for a game time decision indicator. So if a player is indicated as a game time decision, I've actually multiplied his final projected points total um, by 0.65, essentially representing the idea that if they're a game time decision, they're about 65% chance to play. I, I mean, I have no idea if that's close to an actual you know, number. And if you guys actually know a number on that, if you guys any have got have any statistics regarding how often players play when they're a game time decision or not, I mean, obviously it would for me anyways. A game time decision kind of represents a 50-50, but I always feel like players tend to play when it comes down to a game time decision over not playing. But it really depends on the the case, and this number is just completely arbitrary. Uh, it's not rooted in any sort of study or math that I've found. Uh, so just completely ar arbitrary number here, but for me it serves a purpose because I don't want a player like Joe Embiid who's a game time decision to um, to not be affected by that indicator because there is a likelihood that he won't play. So in this sense, we're essentially saying that he's a 35% chance to not play and a 65% uh, chance to play. So that's why we're multiplying his final points total by 0.65. Um, and then to actually get to the at that point total, like I mentioned, you basically just need to take all the um, the stats and then just multiply it by how many points they're worth. So, uh, for example, points are just worth a point per point, essentially. So we don't have to multiply that by anything. Three-pointers made are worth 0.5 points, so we multiply that total by 0.5, and we just go on the, down the list. So rebounds are worth 1.25, multiply that by 1.25. So very simple logic there. Sum all that together. And then I'd multiply it by this indicator. And of course, if they're out, they're not going to be scoring any points. So you just multiply it by zero if they're out. And then if they're in, there's no other indicators there. So I just, you know, obviously leave it as the projected points total. So that's the, this is the number that we're getting at right here. This is the final projected points total number that I've mentioned previously. Um, so it looks like Beal is probably the projected leader for the day. And if you look at the points over average, uh, which is essentially just a delta between um, the average points that they've scored this season uh, DF, uh, DFS compared to this projected number it's like the match it essentially represent, represents the matchup adjustment being made so for Bradley Beal um, his matchup against the um, Brooklyn Nets and also Joe Harris um, results in a 1.9 matchup delta where we have Embiid and Towns obviously being very much uh, hindered by the fact that they're well uh, Towns is out so um, he is not going to be um, scoring any points and then Embiid is a game time decision so he loses about 18 points from that uh, projected total because there is all that likelihood that he doesn't play at all so that's essentially what I'm trying to represent with that uh, um, that 0.65 so going down the list here we can sort by uh, the adjustment delta or, or points over average we get that Colin Sexton has the uh, most beneficial matchup of the day and Andre Drummond has the second most and uh, let me just say that that might be foreshadowing for later on in this video but you know we'll, we'll see we'll see uh, stay tuned so uh, those two are the top um, adjusted for the day Bradley Beals up there Darius Garland uh, DeAndre Jordan any 
look at the guys they're, they're predicted matchup against as well. See, this is a problem here. Thomas Bryant uh, is out for the season, so a problem there with the matchups. And also, Carl Anthony Towns is listed out for the day. Obviously, he's not a great defender. So um, there's those those sort of things, the inconsistencies in the model, where you have guys that are out injured that are still projected to be the matchup for the given player. Uh, it's something that needs to be fixed. But as for the time being, you know, I'm not going to adjust that because ultimately those matchup ratings are only about 20% um, of the not about 20%. They are 20% of that that weighting of that weighted adjustment. And then also at the same time too, I mean, if a player's out, their backup will likely be in. Um, so it's you know it just it's still at the same time not really the the hugest difference. Um, but at the same time, if you really want an accurate model, I would highly recommend you know embedding that that injury information in the matchup sheet as well, which is doable. And once again, if it's something you want you guys want me to see do, um, you know I can do that in another video. So here we get to the uh, the meat and bones of the entire model, which is the solver sheet. And after all this, we've derived projections for every player. We have um, compiled all the the useful the, the data we need really into this projection sheet, like I called it the master sheet. And now we have um, the actual solver um, page here. So how this is going to work? And if you're not familiar with solver, I really hadn't used solver too much either. Previous, you know, a few days ago was really the first time I looked into it. And uh, it's it, essentially what you're doing with solver is you can maximize or minimize or manipulate um, a sheet to to derive the maximum or minimum of a formula. And in this sense, uh, in this scenario, if you think about it, you know, what do we want to maximize? We want to, we want to maximize the projected points, but we also have constraints that we have to consider. So the constraints are going to be the important logical piece of this thing that that needs to be you know embedded into the solver formula. So if you're not familiar with solver, it's an add-on in Excel. You can get it for free, um, really nice and simple. And the way that I've lined this up is just pulling in the players, pulling in the position, of course, always with an FNA just to uh, um, to adjust for the fact that there, you know, there are some um, errors within the player calling when it comes to a player not having played yet with the basketball reference, and then it's, you know, they can't call them in, so that results in an NA. Stuff like that is why I still like to um, embed the formulas inside an FNA a lot of the time. Then we have just, you're pulling in the points projection, so that's gonna be the 83 of uh, which I just talked about here, and then we're also pulling in the matchup delta, uh, which is what that's what I was referencing earlier, it's the points over average, and uh, it just shows visually, you know, uh, which players are benefiting and which players are, hin are getting hindered the most by their their given matchup and opposition, and then we're pulling in the salary as well. If salary very important to be a part of the sheet. You don't have to make it look as fancy as I did. I just wanted to make it fancy for you know uh, presentation sake, but at the end of the day. Uh, you don't need any colors. You don't need any. You know. You, know, you don't need any uh, um, uh, presentation um, quirks at all with this sheet. It just you know just call them in. Um, so what we need to start doing is uh, basically creating a solver formula. And um, the, another thing I've done too, which I guess I'll probably talk about later, is created another individual ID where I can pull the players in. So just keep that in the back of your mind. We're going to need to need to create another ID for the players. Uh, and it just needs to be unique so I can call all the players into that the resulting you know eight players that have been selected. Um, so the first thing you want to do is make this starter column. You don't have to call it starter, uh, but basically it's going to result in a binary zero or one, uh, a one if the, the formula selects the player, and a zero if the formula does not select the player. And then what you need to do with these um, five, you need to have one per position. So if you're working with another sport like football, for example. Um, just make one per position that that is going to be you know selected, and uh, essentially just just say um, if C5. So if the position um, of the given player is point guard aligning with the column, um, then you multiply one times H5, which is whether or not he's a starter. So if he is a starter and he is a point guard, it results in a one column. And the reason I do this it, it will be shown later. But we basically need to count how many players are selected in each position to make sure that they align with the constraints of the formula. Because um, looking at the actual roster rules for this here, as you can see, the eight roster positions are point guard, sh shooting guard, small forward, power forward, center. And then you have one guard, which can be a point guard or shooting guard, one forward, which can be a small forward or power forward, and one utility, which is basically like a flex for fantasy football, where it can be any position. Obviously, fantasy football flex cannot be quarterback, but that really doesn't matter. I mean, uh, anyways, though. Uh, so that's 
that's kind of the lineup constraints or line requirements that we have for this selection process. So we actually need to be able to count, okay, how many of each player is the model selecting? We need to create a constraint so the model can't select, you know, four point guards. And that's what I've done over here. So you can start to uh, line this up where it's create a little matrix almost where you have point guard, shooting guard, small forward, power forward, center. Then I also need to count guard and forward to make sure that there's not too many guards and forwards as well just due to the line requirements. But obviously this will all change if your league has different requirements for lineups. Oh, so we need to set a max. So logically, if you think about it, the max amount of point guards we can have is three. One starting point guard, one starting guard, and one starting utility point guard. Um, so that's that's kind of the way it's going to work for almost all positions uh, besides center. Uh, center is just two because um, the other you know ambiguous positions of, of, of uh, guard and forward don't include center. So there actually can only be two centers, one as a starting center and two utility center if, if it were to select another center. So you set the max, um, you also need to set a minimum and actually total guards as well will be four for this for this uh, uh, particular set of requirements because the max amount of guards would be um, you know a point guard, a shooting guard, um, and then another guard and then another guard select as, as a utility guard which would be four. So the max for four uh, for guard and forward would be four, uh, uh, four, and then the minimum you need to have is three, and then the minimum for every position as well will be one. So you need to have at least one point guard because there is going to be at least a starting point guard in the uh, the starting eight. Um, but so you need to have at, at least one of every position, um, and, and that's going to be another constraint for the solver formula because if you don't set those requirements, then it's going to be selecting. It could end up selecting you know six guards, but obviously you can't start six guards in your DFS. Um, uh, league based on the requirements. So once again, it would make this this uh, um, th this you know this model ultimately useless because of the fact that its requirements aren't the same as as the actual league's requirements. So that's that. I'll talk about the uh, the column process later, but this is just like it's not really important. It's really just just to display the players that have been selected. Um, but another important section here you want to set up is just set a uh, a, um, a cell with your salary in it. And then you also want to use a sum product formula. That's basically just multiplying two arrays. And so if um, the array of H, if any, if any cell results in a one, which of course has already been calculated earlier, or will be calculated later, sorry, with the solver, if that makes sense, where um, it's going to be binary, so it's going to be a zero or one. If the start is a one, then it'll result in this ultimate sum of the salary being added to it. So um, let's say um, Kyrie Irving is selected, then his, his uh, 9,300 salary would be summed together with the rest of the results of the sum product of this of this formula here. So, if, so basically, if it's a one, it's going to count the salary. Um, and if it's not a one, then it will just be a zero times whatever salary it is, resulting obviously in a zero. And then same idea here with the projected points. We just do a sum product this time rather than using the salary uh, column uh, in the blue. And this, of course, is the array one. Um, and then array two will still say is that starter column, which of course, like I said, will result in a binary zero or one. And now with the starting players, we're just going to sum together all the uh, the result, essentially the amount of players um, being selected. And of course, these are actually going to be the sums of all these columns, which I talked about later, which I set up. So the um, solver column here in the matrix of um, position starters um, will be the results of the sums of these columns which are set up, which are essentially testing whether or not, um, or what, what position each player is and whether or not they're starting. And if they're starting in that given position, then it's counted as one. And if they're not, then it's counted as a zero. So that's how that all works. Um, hopefully that all makes sense. I already showed you this formula here. And then the formula to actually sum it is just a very simple sum down the column um, formula there. And then of course for the, we're gonna wanna sum both uh, point guards and shooting guards. Um, and then the forwards, we're going to want, to, want to some um, small forwards and poor, power forwards. And once again, this is just down to the intricacies of the lineup requirements for this given league here. So now comes the important part. We've set all the um, actual stru structure of the sheet to actually run the solver. Now we open solver, and mine's already going to have everything in here. But this is what we need to do. So you're going to need to go down this list of instructions essentially to set this up. So you want to set an objective, and the objective is going to be that final formula that you want to maximize. You could minimize it. You could get the value of a given value, but in this sense, we're going to maximize that. And what we what do we want to maximize? We want to maximize projected points. So you select that uh, that cell that already has the formula in there, projecting maximum points uh, or projected points rather. Um, so that we have the changing variable cells, and that is just going to be those binary cells that I talked about earlier. So if you look at my selection here, 
it's going to be H5 through H204. And by the way, just regarding that, that H5204, the maximum amount of cells you could have as a variable, cha uh, changing variable cell is 200. I was just, I actually struggled with this for a little bit because I was just like, why? What's what's going on? So there's like a linear, linearity issue with the with the solver. And then I looked it up and it said, oh, you, uh, you can only have 200 essentially of these variable cells. So I had to change it, or I had to uh, decrease the amount of variable cells that I had, which essentially just represents the amount of players that are being pulled in and tested whether or not they fit the optimization process uh, to go into that starting lineup. So yeah, you, you can only pull in 200 players and test 200 players. That is the maximum amount. But often days you will, will only have you know 100 or so that you need to test anyways. So and and, and if you think about it too, you know. Thinking about you know teams having about eight role players, so at the end of the day, even if all teams are playing at the same time, you know it's going to be roughly about 240 players potentially appealing or appearing. I guess in these times, you know there are you know more, but significant role players only generally amount to about eight total in, per team with the starting five, and then like the three main role players. So in, in DF, uh, DFS, you don't really need those bench guys because uh, they don't really provide too much value. Um, but moving on with this here, so. We have the uh, constraints which we need to set, which I was already talking about. We need to set constraints for this formula. So we need to uh, consider those uh, requirements that, have, we, that uh, we have in place. We also need to consider the salary and the amount of players. So that's exactly what we're setting here. So if you look at the, the, um, this little row here, um, first we need to set up those binary cells. So basically what we do is if I hit change here, I'll show you. But we just have to select that H5 through 204, which is the changing variable cells. Then you want to go down and hit bin or just binary, and the constraint is binary. So we just need to make sure that it's only a 0 or 1 being returned. That's what that does. And then the rest of them are going to be setting all the requirements that we, we need based on the elite requirements. So if I were to hit change on this one, and all you have to do is just, rather than hitting change, so if I were to hit OK here, to add one, you just hit add. I'm going to hit change though because of course I already have them in. And then it'll bring you to this, uh, this screen here which gives you the uh, constraint um, options. So in this sense I'm setting the salary, it has to be less than or equal to 50,000 which is that Q1. So that 50,000 I've already set there. And then of course the salary, that, that salary formula that's being tested against the 50,000 is the one that's the result of that sum product. So um, essentially I'm testing and I need to make sure that's less than 50,000 because if this resulted in, in uh, a lineup with a salary over 50,000, once again, it would be useless because it doesn't conform to the constraints or, or, requirement, or uh, requirements of the league that I'm participating in. So there we go. So that's that one. Uh, you're also going to want to set the amount of players, which of course are being calculated by um, just the sum of the solver starting lineup stuff that I've already talked about. Um, but you're basically just you know adding together the amount of players that are being selected, and it, it needs to be equal to eight. So you're obviously selecting less than eight or or um, um, more than eight would result in a uh, once again a model that would be useless. Um, and then the reason I actually kind of want to explain this a little bit too. Um, the reason you want to set that uh, the changing variable cells to binary. Um, it, that means that it selects a full player, and each player counts as one, right? So if it wasn't set to binary, you could get a situation where you know you get like a third of a player being selected, or 0.23, or you know 0.72 of a player being selected. Where obviously you know you can't select a third of a player. Uh, it's 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 either a, a zero or a one. You're either selected or you're not. So that's kind of the logic that follows that uh, binary constraint that I talked about a little bit earlier. Um, so moving down here, so now we just need to set all the lineup constraints, and it's a little tedious just because it, it, I mean, it doesn't take too long to do, but you just need to make sure and pay attention and uh, pay uh, close attention to detail essentially to make sure that you've got all these constraints right. But it's the same logic following every single one. So if I were to go down and do this one, which is the uh, setting the point guard constraint, um, it, you want it to be less than, or sorry, actually this one you want it to be greater, uh, or less, sorry, less than or equal to six. I was, I was right, or uh, Q6, sorry. I was, I was correct. And uh, you're just, you know, you're essentially saying you want this this point guard, uh, the amount of point guards in your selection process, to be less than or equal to that maximum of three, and it can't be greater than. And because this constrains the solver, um, then you know it will stay within the requirements of your league. So that's exactly how that works. So S6 is less than or equal to Q6, which of course is that maximum. So you hit OK. And then you move down, and you have to now do it for the minimum, except it's the opposite. So you want it to be uh, S6, you want it to be greater than or equal to 
uh, the minimum, which is R6, as you can see here. So R6 is that, that minimum of one, and you're gonna wanna do that for every single position and make sure that you have that the logic behind the maximum and minimums you know right because if you mess that up then it could also mess with the selection process of your final your final optimized lineup so um, that's how it works I, I'm not going to go down and do all that but as you can see here I basically just did that same logic for every single one so everyone's going to be less than or equal to that that Q column which of course is the maximum and then it's going to be greater than or equal to that R column which of course is that um, minimum and you want to make sure too that you see how I'm selecting all these at the S column um, um, cells. So you have S10, S11, S12. Um, those are the ones that are resulting um, fr from the solver um, sums, so like the sum of the solver um, selection. So if I were to just hit change this one, um, actually I can head, I can just straight up head out of this to do this one um, on this. Yeah. So this solver column here that we're actually testing against, it is of course going to be the sum of the the selections of the solver um, optimization. So just wanted to clear that up. Moving down from the constraints. So once you've done once you've done that, so think so. Keep in mind just the most important parts. You want to set the uh, changing variables to binary. You want to um, well actually select the, the changing variables themselves. You want to set the objective as that projected points because of course that is the number we want to maximize um, the projected points cell. And then you want to also make sure that your salary is less than or equal to 50,000. Make sure you don't hit equal to 50,000 because there are some scenarios where you can actually maximize the points totals with uh, a number less than 50,000. So make sure it's less than or equal to 50,000, not equal to 30, uh, 50,000 or you know whatever salary you're at. Um, then R3, you just wanna make sure that R3 equal to Q3, as you can see there, you just wanna make sure that uh, your players um, number of eight is is equal to eight or equal to whatever amount of players you can get obviously you don't want to select more or less players um, than you can um, and then moving down the list you just want to make sure that each um, position total is less than or equal to the maximum and greater than or equal to the minimum and so you're going to have two constraints for each in this scenario anyways you have two constraints for each uh, position and then also the added guard and forward um, where the the max is four and the minimum is three, and obviously if this you know this could change for another requirements a set of requirements where let's say you need exactly you know two point guards and two shooting guards then you would just hit equal to and it actually save you a few of these constraints, um, and then the last thing you want to do for this thing is uh, uh, change the solving method to simplex LP that's essentially the method that will um, that gen generate the linear solver problems, and then that really should be it. So if you have all this set up. Then what you can do is hit solve with errors, likely down to um, the equations that you're using throughout the sheet or the formulas you're using throughout the sheet or uh, down to the constraints that you're using. And I'll explain an error that I came across. But uh, first uh, first and foremost, let's talk about the actual results of this thing. So you'll get a little um, pop up here. Um, solver found an integer solution with intolerance, uh, with intolerance of all the constraints and the constraints are all satisfied. So we want to keep the solution, and then we can review the results. So here we go. So the eight optimum players to select for this day of games, which is this is going to be like the late um, slate of games on Sunday, um, just for reference, uh, January 31st. We have Colin Sexton, Seth Curry, Tobias Harris, DeMontis Sabonis, uh, Andre Drummond, and JaVale McGee, both centers for um, Cleveland. And then we also have Darius Garland and C.D. Osman. So, so Cleveland is a favorite, obviously. Of, of this uh, selection here, very interesting. Um, but obviously, the model likes the matchup against. Um, I think it was who was it? Minnesota. That's who it was. It was Minnesota. So, um, but that's that's where we're seeing value here. So, taking a look at the selections, we have Sabonis at a plus one point one matchup delta. Model likes him uh, at uh, nine thousand one hundred. He's our most expensive player. Uh, Drummond at plus two point two. Harris at plus point nine. Sexton at plus two point four. Um, then we have Garland at plus 1.9. Uh, moving down the list, we have um, Osman at plus 1.1. Seth Curry at minus 0.9. So he's really the only player that matchup delta um, results in a negative. And I think the last player here is going to be JaVale McGee um, down here, center two um, at a uh, plus one. So you can see here that this thing is really useful, really simple to update. Um, the actual process of, of creating this thing, you know, it's a little complex, but I think once you get to a point of understanding, um, then it becomes just a matter of, like I said, you know, updating daily. 
And um, looking at the results of it, you can tell it's a little bit skewed for matchup. You know, I, mean, I say a little bit skewed. I mean, like that's kind of the purpose of this thing is to derive value from the matchups. But like looking at uh, you have Colin Sexton and uh, Darius Garland, Andre Drummond, Sadie Osman, and JaVale McGee, um, all from Cleveland. And it's just one of those things where, uh, you know, you could argue that maybe that's, that's a, a hindrance to your final total. But at the same time, we're finding these players at good value. And um, at the end of the day, you know, we, we could benefit from a big day against Minnesota, who is obviously going to be hurting from the loss of um, Carl Anthony Towns. So, yeah, we'll see. Obviously likes the matchup there. Minnesota, not a great defensive team. And that's kind of what the model sees there. So uh, that's going to be the final eight players. So let's actually s stick them in here and, and put them in for the day. Um, I actually have run this a few times already just to test it. And it's done pretty well um, overall. So obviously, you know, the sample size would still be small. But uh, yeah, let's go ahead and, and put in these players. Actually, you know, I, I'll save you guys the time. I know this has been probably a long process anyway. So um, I'll, I'll just skip to when I put them in. And then I will kind of sum up this whole thing. And hopefully you guys have enjoyed um, the process so far. And if you guys have any questions along the way, just let me know because I know this thing can be... I Well, I like to talk fast. And also I like to go into things um, kind of in depth. So if I have gone over something too quickly just let me know and i'll of course be happy to answer any questions you have in the comments okay so one thing i forgot to mention as well is in this uh, slate of games there's only four i was going to say like wow we've selected a lot of cleveland players also have two uh philadelphia players in there as well but i i really think that the uh the reason behind that is because there is only four games going on in the slate and we just kind of identified uh the two we like uh, value against which of course uh were, were um, you know eight or seven of the eight players are from cleveland or Philadelphia. So if you look at those matchups here, just quickly, just, just for reference, um, Philadelphia is playing Indiana. So we like that matchup for, your, for a few points. We do select uh, Sabanis against Philadelphia, who uh, his matchup is going to be Mike Scott. Um, so there we go there. We like Sabanis against Mike Scott. Um, but anyways, that's kind of why um, we have so many players from Cleveland. I think on a normal day, like actually the other yesterday, um, we had a pretty varied selection, which is it was pretty cool. We actually uh, selected one of my favorite players, Tyrese Halliburton, or and I say we, I mean the the, the solver model, and uh, he had a pretty good night. Uh, Christian Woods, another favorite, so uh, of of this model so far early on. So uh, yeah, I mean pretty cool results so far. I'll I'll be tracking this thing for a little bit. Um, well, like I said, if you guys are interested in, uh, well, hopefully you guys followed along pretty well. Um, any comments or questions, let me know. If you guys are interested in getting your hands on this thing, feel free to reach out to my email. That's riley at expectededgesports.com. This will be in the description. Um, other than that, yeah, uh, feel free to like and subscribe if you guys enjoyed. Um, really looking to invest more time into this channel right now. And uh, um, hopefully you guys um, are, uh, you know, looking forward to more from me as well because I think I have a lot uh, of ideas in the back of my brain right now. And a lot of video video ideas planned going forward. So, um, yeah, looking to continue to to push forward with this thing. So, um, thanks for tuning in today. Um, if I miss anything, of course, let me know. Uh, any suggestions for new videos? Once again, you guys know the drill. Just uh, leave me a nice little comment in the comment section, or uh, feel free to reach out on my email. Other than that, I will see you guys later.